Welcome back to Modern Education. I'm the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford, here in the studio with you once again uh, to bring you another exciting conversation. And my co-host is here with me, Emily Keyless. Hello. How are you, Ben? Oh, it's How's so good to Friday? have you back into the studio, Emily. As I don't know. Always. I don't know how to do this anymore without you. Life is just <laughs> not fun without a co-host. It's not the same. I wish I had a co-host in every part of my life. Like I get up to brush my teeth and I go, hey, what's on the show? for today, Emily, and then I start brushing my teeth. A little bit teeth. of extra Colgate. Oh, yeah. We're, hey, we are on non-commercial radio. We say toothpaste, not Colgate. <laughs> toothpaste. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm excited to see you back, and I'm excited for uh, bringing our guest on the mic here in a minute. What are we going to be doing today, Emily? We are talking to Bob Montenegro. Sorry, I'm going to completely mess up. Martinego um, is a publisher of Outreach Specialist um, for the Center for Accessible Material Innovation. He has helped develop and implement the accessibility label, which has helped imp- promote materials such as books for visuals, auditory, motor, and cognitive skills. Bob has also worked for recording for de- blind and dyslexic and has started the ac- Access Text Network to help help ensure students with disabilities have equal access to textbooks and electronic form and in a timely manner. I don't know why I struggle with that so much. That was a a mouthful, yeah. (laughs) But Bob, thank you so much for coming on air with us. Thank you both for having me. Yeah, it's a real joy to have you in here. We get a little scratchy on the mic. I hope that's not uh, coming out in the air. If you are on the airwaves right now and you're hearing that scratchy too, we're very sorry about that. Let us know. Give us a text at 855-723-9010. We always love to hear from our guest and from our audience. Uh, Bob, so we got you on the mic here. We got you down in the studio. We really appreciate you making the time. Can you start by telling us a little bit about where you're coming from and, and sort of your your genesis coming into where you are right now, some of your history, and, and just help the audience know who you are and where you're at? Uh, sure. Thank you so much. And um, I, I'd like to stop Start. <laughs> like a start. Mm-hmm. Start back with how I kind of got involved in the accessibility field. Mm-hmm. It was an organization called Recording for the Blind and Dyslexic, as you, as you said, Emily, and that was about a little over twenty years ago. And what that organization does was record textbooks, college textbooks, higher ed, uh, grade school, all all different kinds of textbooks, and for use by people with disabilities. So that'd be individuals who are blind. Obviously, that's how they got started. Was record, they were originally called Recording for the Blind, and later they added dyslexic to their name to indicate that uh, students who are dyslexic were also benefiting from audio textbooks. Mm. I think everybody really benefits from audio textbooks, right? There's, well, not, a, there's not a person who can't uh, access that. That's a great point, a deaf person, maybe, I guess. We will definitely get into that, yeah. because this that's really one of the reasons I really wanted to be on the show and talk about it, was mm. in a lot of ways, the technology of you know, digital technology, bringing audio books closer, making more affordable, things like downloadable, some of that hasn't really reached students with disabilities in a way that you think it might. Mm-hmm. In other words, gee, the technology's there. How come it's not more available, right? How, right. Why is there maybe a, a delay for a student with disability to get their material? might take them longer than right. another student. And you'd say, is it a technology issue? In a lot of cases, the answer is no. There's other, there's other factors that are keeping from these students being equally competitive. Okay, I think I derailed you, so <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> let's get back to your genesis. I, I'll, I'm sorry about I'll, that. I'll, we take tangents a lot on this show, so... You in return, I'm... Yeah, please do. <laughs> so, at, uh, at, uh, basically, the reason I got the job at recording for the... I'll also say RFBND, because I love acronyms and it's a lot quicker. The reason I got the job at RFBND is they had 200 volunteers at the studio. They needed somebody who was good with managing volunteers. Mm. Right? So This the, is the, notoriously hard. It's like herding <laughs> cats, right? <laughs> I, I think as being probably both of folks are volunteers, you certainly know that. Uh, yes. It, volunteers... Uh, what was exciting about RFBND is that these folks were um, teachers, professors, retired uh, professors, medical, you know, doctors who had subject matter expertise. That's mm. very important. Yeah. Because they're reading college level textbooks. They can't, uh, we don't want them to be stumbling over words or saying things incorrectly. So they needed that subject matter expertise. Mm-hmm. And, and these they, are the people reading? Absolutely. Okay, right. Great, they would great. be reading. And then the, these, these were recorded on real to real tape machines, which were actually already vintage even then. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
but the idea was that they might come in two hours a week, right? And they would expect to have like little cookies and stacks, you know, that we would we would put them there. To, so this idea that we were uh, our workforce that we depended on, that these students were depending on, was volunteer, mm-hmm. right? Right. So we wanted to treat them well, and and I had a lot of retail experience, so I knew about working with customers, and um, but. Really, that's how I got started. But the, my career kind of took off because a nonprofit organization like RFB and D was not able to meet the demand. So this is kind of a theme I'll keep coming back to, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Students with disabilities would call us actually and say, "Hey, this is I need uh, introductory economics, or you know, I, basically all the list of textbooks might be three or five that they're taking for that semester." Mm-hmm. And I would actually place the order for them in our system, and I, but then I'd say, "Oh, we don't have that one." Right. And so we go, oh, gosh, you know, that's gee, OK. Or I might say, oh, the fourth edition, we've only recorded the third edition, mm. for example. Right. OK, I guess I could take that. So I began to wonder what's happening to these students if they if we're not helping them. Who is now? Again, this is uh, the late 90s. And I think it hasn't changed that much since then. I mean, there are, there are more things in place, more possibilities, but I'm not seeing that that is a, a blanket coverage that is just happening by default by now. And you would think after all that time, hopefully it would be a better situation. Yeah. Um, this is, well, w- one reason I wanted to, you know, again, sort of spread this message and sort of talk about not just the last 20 years, you know, where how I got to this yeah. place, but what I would like to see happen, because you're right. Yeah. I, you're right. I think, again, not just not just about technology. Uh, you, someone could say, well, you know, with the economics aren't there. No, that's part of it. But there's other barriers. And I maybe, we, you know, if we since we have some time to go into that, we can un- unpack that a little more. Yeah, absolutely. But um, really, the, the, the short answer to what those students were doing is they were going back to their disability service office. I'll, I'll use that term a lot, or DSS office. That's the college or university you know, school that they were attending. And they'd say, gosh, I can't get this book, you know, from this RFB and D. Mm-hmm. And the colleges, these, the staff was going to the publisher. That's really the theme sort of my career is that these nonprofit agencies weren't able to meet the demand. So they were going back to the, you know, the textbook publisher. And I won't necessarily name names, but you guys, mm-hmm. we all, we all know who the publishers are. Right, right? Right. Yeah. The, the big, about five of them and no one ever has heard any of anything else except those five. <laughs> right. It's exactly. Right. And, uh, Although there are hundreds more, and I ended up getting to know a lot of the smaller ones because yeah. you know, students really take a lot of books. So, again, and interrupt me at any time, you know, mm-hmm. but, but really the, the, the thread was, as since the nonprofit agencies could not meet the demand, or were, were not able to, again, all, all our volunteers were working at capacity. I had a certain amount of recording capacity. I had so many volunteers coming in. They could only read so much. Mm-hmm. So there was no real way to expand. And this is re- actually recorded for the wine. rfb and had uh, 30 studios around the country. So my studio was in Los Angeles, but we had three more, uh, two more studios in Southern California, mm-hmm. one in Northern California, actually here in public. How is this funded? That was all through, well, donations, but also federal yeah. funding. Okay, that so they, right. there was some federal funding. Was that coming from the State Department or the yeah. Department of Education? That was through the Department of Education. And a really interesting thing happened a few years after I left rfb and which was a lot of their fu- the funding that they had been getting on a regular basis was awarded to a new organization based in, well, drum roll, Palo Alto. Mm. Oh, that that's organization, close to home. Well, they, they had a, they were more... Uh, tech friendly. They basically, their model was not to use human readers, but electronic versions of the text. Mm, okay. so the right now we're, we're, we're talking about the early uh, 2000s. So the computer well, voice... Was, text to speech now is so much better. That's a lot more viable than it was then, right? You're absolutely right. Mm. So, but the challenge with textbooks, you can imagine, is it's not all... Um, what say, easily pronounceable words. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and diagrams and all kinds of other exactly things. That. Yeah. That, that's where our human readers um, our human readers were really, really valuable because they would interpret the charts and graphs and put them, you know, again, describe them for a student who could not see. Mm. Whereas the electronic version, it's there is no uh, easy equivalent for that. So um, when you say electronic version, are you talking about robot? sounds? Well, first of all, it, the first thing is it has to be text she's form. She's doing a robot uh, <laughs> movement with her body as she says that. She was dancing the robot right here in the studio, yeah, for those pretty, of you who can't see. It was pretty exciting. Yeah. Thanks for that audio, that audio description there. Right, right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, first of all, it has to be, for, for as you imagine, a human being reading it would just use their own words to interpret the picture, right? As, okay. as, they, yeah. as they encounter it. For an electronic version, if the student is going to hear that read aloud, someone has to prepare that for them. 
Right. So we're, we're talking about something that's an image that someone might type up a description, you know. Mm. This is a picture of a horse and it's jumping over, you know, a stanchion, something like that. In other words, but that's a lot of extra work. And that was not, that's the distinction, I would say, in between a human recorded product, which is read by a real person. Right. And electronic version, which all that information has to be prepared and put into the document, you know, put into it that. It still needs to be prepared by a real person anyway. A we, computer no, can't do anything meaningful with step. that. It, it's Yet. The, <laughs> the lure, I would say, and I, this may be a theme that comes up also, you know, mm-hmm. in Silicon Valley, sometimes the lure that technology was the answer right away mm-hmm. was, I think, premature when you're talking about complex right. books. It's Yes, you can read a simple, you know, the computer can read something aloud and that's plain text and it's understandable. And as you, as you said, the, the voices have gotten better quality. But still, the challenge of reading educational material aloud and having a computer do that, there's still a lot of challenges there. Oh yeah, there's so much uh, terminology and specific knowledge required to even understand what some of those words mean. So, and the computer isn't really... It isn't capable of doing that yet. Mm-hmm. So the, the folks now, I've been talking about a nonprofit agency, RFB and D, but the folks at the schools, right, that are that are helping, you know, the students come to them for these services, the Disability Service Office, and there's mm-hmm. one here on Stanford as well, and they, they would do similar things. Those folks are trained basically to do accommodations, mm-hmm. right? To Their job, as, as it was just, I just recently was reminded of this, their job isn't necessarily to be, you know, an advocate for people with disabilities and inclusion. Their job is to get them out. Access. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So imagine this scenario. The, <laughs> the, the student comes in and says, I've got this introduction to economics book. And the disability service office person will request a file from the publisher. Right. But so there was, that's, this is what I did with this access text, which you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Really, I can certainly expound on that. But access text was simply a way for that school to efficiently contact the publisher, one of the big five or big three. Mm-hmm. That publisher would send back, in most cases, a PDF file, which now we, I think we've all become more familiar with PDF files and what mm-hmm. they are. But basically, it's a visual representation of the book. It wouldn't necessarily have any of that um, symbolic information like the charts and graphs described. Mm. So It, would it just may not even choice. have like an optical character recognition it, on, that, on that's it. That's quite possible, too. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's kind of a raw product that the Disability Service Office would then continue to work on, mm. possibly even at the at hours of time, to make it so that the student could use it properly. So is I go through this mm-hmm. on a regular basis where I actually contact my own disability resources center here on campus. And uh, very often I'm looking for obscure books from the library that don't have any digital version of it. Mm-hmm. And then they'll take it and manually scan the book for me. And it's wow. hours. I mean, it'll, it'll be a week or more turnover. And half the time I don't even need the book anymore by then because I had to keep moving forward with my yeah. work. So it also is like the, as being a student, it has like very small time increments where this can actually work. And well, yet, because my question please. really is, like, so basically, why is that the publisher isn't doing all that work in advance? Why is it going through the disability services? Well, this is what I've put my career yeah, exactly. <laughs> to help answer. And so these publishers. There's a re- yeah. Right. So uh, let's, let's. So, you know, not to go too far back, but, you know, uh, Gutenberg, right? <laughs> the printing press. So we've had print for so long, right? <laughs> it's not too far back. <laughs> it's not too far back. <laughs> now let's go back to oral tradition. So, so Gutenberg, <laughs> but print has been around for years, right? We built up entire systems about it, right? The libraries, mm-hmm. the, the shelving, all those wonderful things. So when digitiz- digitalization, you know, mm-hmm. let me work on that one. Mm-hmm. When digitalization really hit the publishing industry, it started, you know, everything in the production of print, but print was always the final product, right? First, we're going to digitize the, you know, preparing the manuscripts, then we're going to digitize this, digitize that. But then it would be essentially at some point, you really didn't have to have anything on paper until you went to the printer. And that's what PDF was for, so that the printer would get this perfect idea of a page, right? Mm-hmm. So, but all those things were done very efficiently for the print version. They weren't thinking of how someone, like a student, would use the electronic version. Mm-hmm. So what they, what these publishers were giving the Disability Service Office was essentially like a snapshot of the book electronically, but it didn't have any of those, you know, the features that a person with a disability would use to navigate the book, or even as Ben said, just to even get in there and use it just at all. read it, like right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So if you're saying, the question is, why didn't they do that? For a long time, there wasn't a market. Students with disabilities are a small segment of the population. 
So they weren't really selling the books to them, right? They're not going to create an expensive product for a small group. What happened was electronic books became more mainstream. Mm-hmm. And, you know, nowadays, most of us have downloaded books. With Audible, yeah. Right, or, but also download an electronic book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Again, like I won't, the Kindle versions or whatever, right? That's a brand name. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we don't support that particular brand. Well, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like if I said Kleenex, you know, you would think like that you would say, oh, a yeah, tissue. tissue, but, right. Yeah. It's become the, the, well, let's just the say, item, yeah. right. Kindle, they did a good job at making that like almost like a feel like a brand name for like right. a book. But underlying that, <clears throat> electronic book format, which we you know, won't say, keep saying over it because that's free advertising for them. <laughs> but underlying that is structure, right? That, that if you say, I want to go to page 100, somebody, you know, marked, marked that file up similar to like you would a book so you could jump to page 100. A person with a disability navigating a book needs that same technology, right? They mm-hmm. need to be able to move back and forth. Mm-hmm. Right. And so when digital technology really began becoming more mainstream, People with disabilities had lots of actually pioneering ideas. They'd been using that for a long time, right? They, they, they were products that would be called screen reader. So the blind person could operate a computer, not, you know, not as a necessarily even as an educational tool, but just right. to get, operate a personal computer, right? Yeah. There was technology that was, I, 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 I'll come back to this, the word special, but specialized technology so that you could use your computer without seeing the screen, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And keystrokes and audio, and keystrokes and audio feedback. Mm. So what we have here, let's try to sum it up because there's a lot of, it's a lot of threads. I can we, see you're going to reel it in for us here. This is <laughs> well, that, we have plenty of time left of the show, right? Yeah, we, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so far, we've said people with disabilities have used a lot of technology, right? They're, they're dependent. You know, they want to use the computer technology. It was able to, uh, uh, as you said, text-to-speech was mm-hmm. very useful for people who can't see. So you had that technology working. And um, then you had education, and you had technology for changing the way books are created, Right. But what we haven't really had, you haven't really had the market for it. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. So when publishers put out, excuse me, the first electronic books, they really weren't much more functional than a digital copy of the screen. Right. They just skipped the step of putting it to the printer. It just, basically. right. You, you, what you would see on the screen as a sighted person, mm-hmm. you say, oh, I see the words there. But you couldn't even, it let, for example, the computer didn't recognize the individual letters. It was almost as if you just taken a picture of the page. Mm-hmm. So for mm-hmm. a computer to be able to do that text to speech, right, each letter, of course, has to be in the file, like, like a digital file. Is this file. like, because I'm trying to see it myself, because I've, I've had PDS before where I wanted to copy and paste it and then ends up like the, the blue highlight kind of goes all over the place and it's not, it's confused. So that's, that's Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, what that's exactly what's reading. going on there. Okay. The computer hasn't formatted, or it has that paper hasn't been formatted yeah. correctly. And not only that, it's actually out of alignment, yeah. right? So, so it goes, jumps all over the page. Right, yeah. so a person with a disability using these technologies would hear something just stop in the middle of a yeah. <laughs> sentence, jump over here, read something else, maybe come back to that sentence, total like a spaghetti. If yeah. you're looking at it visually, it looks fine, right? It, right? it reads top to bottom, left to right, you know? But as an electronic version, it's it could be you know garbage in garbage out mm-hmm. and that again the technology is there to fix it um, but even now here in 2019 a lot still a lot of times students with disabilities are encountering those same problems mm. this is very behind in a way yeah absolutely and it really does make a huge difference i mean i use uh optical character recognized everything I use all digital at this point and my or almost as much as I can afford to <laughs> use all digital everything so I'm not carrying books around I'm a wheelchair user so it's like mm. carrying a, a stack of books is just a ridiculous thing to ask of somebody that's got a healthy back let's be real you know who wants to carry around 500 pounds of books in their backpack <laughs> at this point in day and age right and every once in a while you'll get a, a, a PDF document or something like that and it'll just read straight across the margins and then you get all these half a sentence half a sentence half a sentence <laughs> half a sentence and you go oh this makes no sense and you got to start over and find another another way I have many many ways at this point but that is the process of someone actually having a disability trying to use different mediums is literally a process of just trying to make it work for most people because it's not thought of ahead of time well let's so let's draw that's that's we've had a couple of time points right that we've mentioned my start of my career the late 90s you know um i'm mentioning that this um you know that k format that we mentioned that that's that electronic book format came out Mm -hmm. in 2007, which is a while ago now. Mm -hmm. In 2010, there's another little landmark coming 2010, 2011. That was the Federal Commission. 
so basically, the, someone in the Department of Education thought enough of this problem to study it. It was actually a, a particular federal, com- federal commission on accessibility of instructional materials in higher education. So they got together a lot of really good people in this area, one from the nonprofit organization here in, in Palo Alto, one from you know, RFB&D. One the, I'm, I'm referring to Bookshare when I talk mm-hmm. about one in Palo Alto. Mm-hmm. Uh, RFB&D was represented. Students were represented. Publishers were represented. And they got together and they created a document of uh, basically uh, recommendations for Congress. Mm. You know, to say, wh- how, what, what can we do about this? And um, so what, what were some of those recommendations or what were some of the like key points that came out of that? Well, um, so the one that stuck in my head and I really then built, a, a, you know, I, I worked on that for the next. It gave me the idea for basically what I've been doing since then was that it kind of goes back to what you're saying, Emily, is for these materials to be accessible in the marketplace. So a student with a disability should be able to buy something or acquire it just like a student without a disability mm-hmm. that would work for them. Mm-hmm. So that it was sort of like saying this is the end state. This is where we want to get to, which would be these materials would be available in the marketplace. So if I bought an electronic book, it would be able to do work with these screen reader technologies and such. And so there wasn't there were some recommendations maybe or thoughts about how to get there, but it wasn't real exactly clear because you're saying these are big, uh, the publishing companies, um, they had big investments in their current technology. They might say something like, well, you know, as we're revising our new materials and we're looking three to five years out, we could introduce some of these features. Sure, three to five years out, maybe that'd be great. But in the meantime, what know, are we going to do? Students yeah. are still struggling. Yeah. Right, right. So this, this sort of brings us... In it sounds like we're leading into where you're heading now, so I'm just going to try to set that up for you a little bit. If, um, yeah, as people uh, were starting to put and talk about putting labels on food, there was a really powerful thing going on there of trying to give people the information they needed to be able to make good food choices. And the mm-hmm. assumption was that this was going to give people the opportunity to be more healthy and to eat things that were better for them. And there was, you know, fear around that in the industries around what that would mean. And I mean, there's similar things going on now or, you know, recently around GMOs and things like that, where people are resisting putting on a new label, Mm -hmm. which to me seems really strange to resist giving people information, right? Knowledge is power. I agree. Yeah. And so I think you, you've taken this, this simple idea and uh, used it as an analogy to create what you're working on now. Mm Mm-hmm. You want to fill us in on, on how you've taken that and what that analogy has meant to you as you move forward? You said it so well. But <laughs> <laughs> not only, you, you definitely set, it, set, set, set me up there. So, um, so going from that AIM commission, they said market-based approach, right? Get these, these products out into the marketplace. And a lot of people at the time, a lot of publishers were saying, we are doing some things. We're adding some features or characteristics to our product that would help people with disabilities. And right away, again, I jumped to that label analogy. What are those things? How is someone supposed to know? Mm -hmm. So if you would go to a publisher's website and look somewhere, usually there's a page somewhere on there, there's something that says accessibility, right? You scroll down, you look, aha, click. And that would be generally a general statement, right? They'd say, we, first of all, they, you know, they affirm their commitment to accessibility. That's great, you know. And then they say, we're trying, you know, we're doing, we're adding these things. And then generally there's somewhere towards the bottom, there's a little disclaimer, you know, kind of a fine print saying, on the other hand, you know, our products aren't perfect and we're working, you know, well, Mm -hmm. if you, if you. We're trying. Typical it, disclaimer. Yeah, you know, the small This is person. not a guarantee of accessibility. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, they, they want, in other words, yeah, they're saying, you know, give us credit for trying and we're, 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 we're making this effort towards it, but we're not perfect. And so, therefore, mm-hmm. you, may ex- you, know, you may encounter problems. Mm-hmm. Which is really nice that they're trying, but it doesn't actually make a difference for the person wanting to access the yeah. book. Yeah. Well, I feel like I'm in a sympathetic audience here. You know, right. You guys are saying, in, in other words, um, um, that that there's they could be doing more, and some of the what what they're saying is the difficulty. We don't really aren't necessarily going to explain. I'm talking about the publisher mm-hmm. on our website why we're not doing this faster. Right? Mm-hmm. We're going to say that we're making you know uh, reasonable all reasonable efforts, and even then. But then to be fair, sometimes we ask sometimes why Emily I say why don't these things aren't happening? Mm-hmm. The people who is the customer though. 
right? And then going back a little bit then to what you yeah. said about what the consumers are, you know, just in that, when people say, we don't want to buy this product if it has this, you know, if it was, um, you know, if certain animals were harmed in the production of it, or we don't want it with this particular product in that, you know, uh, if it was done a certain way, we're going to, you know, as consumers, we're not going to buy that product. Yeah. And they might organize, right? And say, you know, a lot of people don't want to buy this product and we're really, we really think you should change as, as the, as and the we supplier. at least have the right to know if we're going to buy it, what's in it or how it like right. fits our moral judgments or values, right? There, so are you suggesting yeah. that people who don't need accessibility tools, um, should boycott our textbook publishers? The B word. <gasps> well, <laughs> all right, let's, you know what, this, 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 we got this is an education show. We could talk, you guys, especially know, let's talk about the adoption process, right? The adoption of textbooks a little bit. Mm-hmm. How do you know, and, and again, so you this is generally, that. this is generally decided uh, in my knowledge by professors, right? They are seeking out which books they want to teach from and they become the sort of the go between, even though the customer is really the student who's buying the book because they're spending their own money to buy the book, but they're not really choosing which book they're getting. So there's an in- intermediary there. And as far as I know, there's a, a certain level of whining and dining and, and persuading of professors to try to get them to use certain books. Or but to, that's to, as far as higher education, not high school. Correct. Well, I think it works a little differently in high schools in that there are, you know, curriculum departments for any medium or larger sized, um, like district. That's the word I'm looking for. I have a word in my head. It's district. <laughs> or even statewide. Sure, sure. So then there will be a curriculum departments that do a little bit more of the, uh, the dictating to teachers themselves, depending on how mm-hmm. big or small the district is. The teachers may have more, more say in how that gets chosen. But again, it's not the people using the books that are the ones getting to choose their yeah. market share or where their money is being spent. Mm-hmm. Does that, does that fit That's close enough? Absolutely. <laughs> right. Because you're saying, <clears throat> right, supply and demand is a, it's a two-sided thing, but right. it's generally not three-sided, right? Somebody is picking the product, somebody's selling it, and somebody's picking it. Mm-hmm. And that's the publishers are selling it, and generally faculty are picking it, or, as you said, these other kind of committees. The right. students don't get that much of a say. So we have a disconnect between the normal sort of economic process and what's happening in the textbook industry as far as the way the supply and demand are, are addressed. And, and just to take a, you know, a small tangent, which is a, a good topic. Which we is, love those. Which is price. <laughs> yeah. Right? Price, yeah. There's there's actually, uh, there was a, a group, and I believe it was a, uh, a spinoff of Ralph Nader's consumer protection groups called uh, a Student Perg, Public Interest Research Group. And um, they had you know, done a campaign saying that textbooks cost too much. And I, I don't think you'd find a lot of people <laughs> here on campus that would give you a big fight about <laughs> them being textbooks being very expensive. Yeah, but yeah. Now, whether they're too much, they may be, you know, as, as that's, a, that's something you could say you know, publishers would say, well, they're expensive to produce and et cetera, et cetera. So we don't have to get into, you know, there's two sides to the story. But the point is there were, there were folks fighting to get to lower that price, those prices. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and also, and then government responded to that and said, okay, we're hearing you citizens, you know, student citizens, these books are expensive. What can we do as government? And they, they did attempt to address that. One of the things was, um, uh, a little bit different than the labeling approach, information approach, was comparison shopping, though. Kind of like that, which is saying, I think it's part of the Higher Education Act. And I, um, I won't go exactly which year that that came out. but People it, can Google that. They, you're, you're, you're not an encyclopedia. Uh, higher Education <laughs> Act basically said that schools should publish that information. Right? Information yeah. is power. Schools need to put out those, like the, IS, the ISBN, International Standard Book Number, so that a student could say, hey, okay, great. I could see the book that I'm being required to buy, now I can go comparison shopping. Right. So now you're going to Walmart and price checking like that. Or online. Yeah, <laughs> let's be real. Who goes to Walmart anymore? I, I can't even remember the last I time I set foot in a Walmart. Walmart, okay? <laughs> Are we advertising for Walmart right. today? Come on. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to jump to Emily's rescue on this one. Because, yeah, please. <laughs> because Walmart actually operates an online store. That they would actually sell textbooks See? and such. That's, that, that's like Amazon, right? That's what yeah. an online store is? Exactly. So, <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. Power that, uh, Am, the, the brand names are on the back. Oh, yeah. I know. And they're, they're actually, and interestingly enough, there's a mm-hmm. couple of websites that do nothing but consolidate, what's, what's the word, um, consolidate prices? They do the comparison, the comparison shopping, shopping for, you. Yeah. for you. right? You okay. put in, you know, 13975, it brings up, you know, intermediate algebra and then gives you 
10, 20, 30, 40 different places. And you do a, you do a price comparison. Right. Yeah, I That's didn't know great. that. That's great to know. Yeah. I'll be putting that in my bookmark soon. Yeah. And there's also, there's also, um, like book share or book, um, trading sites where people can buy them from other students directly and get kind of a, a deep discount instead of selling it back. I always found it so insulting selling my textbooks back to the bookstore. Cause I'll pay $150 for it and they give me $20 back and then they put it right back on the shelf and sell it again for $145. Open a bookstore. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. It's a great racket. Great racket. So, so the, the analogy there is that the book though is a standardized thing though, right? You can, you can have this price comparison because it's meant to be the same book in all right. formats, right? Yeah. So if you buy it for 10, you see a copy for $10 and one for $20, gee, the $10 one might be beat up. It might have been used more, but essentially it's the same book. Mm-hmm. When we move into accessibility now, we, we don't have that comparison, right? Someone might say, well, there is no electronic book to compare that to. Mm. Right, right. So, so you does know, it end up being more expensive? <sighs> Now we're getting it. Another interesting. <laughs> this is let's 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 bring that thread back in there. Yeah. Publish, publishers of textbooks were not sitting still. They knew digital technology was being you know sort of the wave of the future, and that students would want to buy electronic books. Mm-hmm. So they so I'm talking again. These big publishers got together, and they created. Actually, they started a electronic textbook distribution company. It's called CourseSmart, and it's been now been purchased by another company. But CourseSmart was operate was here in San Mateo, right, close to the Silicon Valley, where a lot of the technology. Uh, companies were, were um, located, and there again, this was this was publishers getting together to say we want you know we need to distribute these electronic books. They didn't have a lot of experience doing that. These first early electronic books who kind of went back to that point. They're not super usable, mm-hmm. right? But but they were electronic, right? They're digital, and the, one of the reasons, one of the selling points again that they said was they're cheaper. So to your point, Ellen, em- Emily, yes, mm-hmm. they said electronic books are cheaper. They basically created or help perpetuate a mindset that digital should be cheaper. Yeah. Right? Right. So for well, better there, or worse. There's something that should be cheaper because you're not getting a physical product, which means there was one part of the process that was cut down <clears throat> in, in along the way. But at the same time, most of the cost of a book is not from the printing. Right? right? It is the, the experts that wrote the book and the editors that put the time into working on it and the visual artists who spent the time formatting and making it pretty and all these other things. So if the so right, so a printed book is an object that you hold and you know I could I could buy a printed book and then give it to a friend right or loan it out a digital book comes with a lot of restrictions on it i can't just easily give a digital book to a friend as a in, mm. and you know and get it back it's locked to my computer right it's got all this kind of what they call digital rights management or drm to ensure that i do not <laughs> do so things it has more copyright regulation it, it it even it goes beyond copyright emily it would go to the point where there's literally technical protection measures locks and chains that they put on there and you have to agree to abide by them before you buy the book mm. so I always thought it was really weird because if you buy the digital version, it should be yours just as have, much as the text it. version. Yeah. You have not bought it. You I should be able to hand it over to the next friend and say, hey, I'm passing this book on to you, right? And that's yeah. really not the case, no. as you were describing, right? Interesting. Why is that? Is that just through the publishing end? No, no, no answer. There's no reason. Well, I think again, a quick tangent would be the music industry, right? When they, uh, when, the, when the, when the first, right, when the first file sharing came out, they, they a lot of the music industry. This is again a pretty well known story, right? With with Napster mm-hmm. and MP3s, mm-hmm. they didn't look at it as a potential new way to sell music. They just looked at it as eroding their existing market, mm-hmm. right? This is this is attacking our model of selling of selling records. Mm-hmm. So they fought it strictly as that. It was our pal Steve Jobs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Apple computer who was able had the clout to sort of com- com- to to convince some folks in the music industry that selling individual songs was what customers wanted and if and he you know with the technology that Apple had could could help make that happen right so that so that record companies could sell individual songs, which were being currently being traded, you know, for free, mm-hmm. that they could make at originally ninety nine cents. Right? Mm-hmm. That, was mm-hmm. original, that was the original price on uh, on iTunes. So again, he it, it was a third party, right? It was somebody. Here's you had you had you had uh, music companies and you had consumers, right? And they weren't agree, you know, they weren't on the same page, mm-hmm. as it were. And here was a third party, a technology company, helped bring them together, right? That's so we're seeing this trend. Based Basically. It's something that has not happened, though, in the world that we've been talking about with these electronic books. So you're trying to essentially create a, a way of labeling these books that's standardized enough between different publishers and different a- 
access points that would make it at least clear knowing what you're getting into when you're yeah. buying a certain version of a book. So when we started this project, or when I started, it, we we uh, this was at a I was working at the uh, Georgia Tech mm-hmm. in Atlanta, mm-hmm. and as a research university, we kind of looked at, again, as a research project, right? If, if we knew that if it was successful, that we would um, have to spin it off either to a nonprofit business or something else. But, but we thought our job was kind of explore this idea. And so we used that nonprofit sort of, you know, uh, um, academic status to invite publishing industry representatives, people in these disability services, uh, students with disabilities, and uh, folks in the publishing services industry, right? Like a publishing company, the big ones that we're talking about, they don't don't do all this stuff themselves. They'll hire a company sometimes overseas, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes here in America that you never heard of this company, but it's like the one that put all the guts into the computer, right? All those companies that do all that technology. And then you heard about the company you're buying it from, but certainly, you know, all the parts were made somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So having those folks that put the products together, having them knowledgeable about accessibility, how a student with disability would use the book, it means that a publisher could say, okay, you know, we want this, our product to be better, so these, this company, right, that, that is going to put it together for us, will say, do it that way, you know, make it more accessible. Mm. We got them together, this is now, we're now time-wise, time, time, time wise, uh, uh, timeline, this would be about 2015, 2016. So we had a great group of representatives working on this, and we, I, I, we, we sort of covered, you know, as we've covered here in this talk, we kind of came up to that point where we said, okay, this is was, was our starting point, you know, that you, this is the technology challenges you have. This is where we want to go, right? Where accessible books will be accessible right out of the, you know, right off the, in the marketplace. So what are those barriers to, you know, to making that happen? We, we address those. And with this idea of the label, it was, I think the first thing between a customer and the, and the seller is information, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. We're all used mm-hmm. to marketing information. Mm, this is the best cereal or soup, right? <laughs> Tasty new, you know, with with greater chunks of vegetables in a soup, you know. Um, so that's marketing information, right? We right. expect a company to sell their product. So that's this not is a the form problem. of marketing. It, well, that's where the problem came in. Uh-huh. Because if they were only going to say what was good about their product, they're not going to say, if, if they're not forced to do those disclaimers, mm-hmm. and I think we all know um, one of the great examples is um, maybe a prescription drug. Mm-hmm. You know, you might see it advertised in a magazine. <laughs> So, so it, it will solve one problem and it will present a hundred others. <laughs> but, but, the but we first keep thing that in small print. It's is, is, is a, is a photograph of somebody running through a field yeah, right, on a sunny yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. And, and that what it's going to do for you. And then you turn the page and you find out, you know, a lot of the, again, the fine print. Yeah. But that, they don't want to put that there. Yeah, the they have special fine labels fine that hide all that fine yeah, print. But they're and, legally, they're yeah. legally obligated. And, and the, and the, and what makes it fair, and I'm giving little air quotes here, air quotes, what makes it fair and air quotes <laughs> is that everyone has to do it. Right. 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 It's a level playing field. So that is where we kind of hit a little bit of a snag in this label project when it came to publishers. So something like that generally happens through a government agency sort of mandating this as a thing that needs to be there versus like a right. per choice or per publisher mm-hmm. choice, right? This is, I'm totally on the right show here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you nailed it, Ben. It's people, they want to put the good news on. They are not voluntarily going to do a lot of the bad news. And when I say bad news, it isn't necessarily terrible news. It's kind of like that accessibility statement I was talking about a little bit while ago. Mm -hmm. They're they're still saying that. If you go to the accessibility statement, they'll say, we're not perfect, right? Mm -hmm. We have, you might encounter this challenge or if we, you know, if it doesn't work for you as the consumer buying our product, call our customer service department and we'll fix it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, there's, they'll say that, right? But they're not going to go into depth on that, and they're not going to make the you know kind of highlight their weaknesses. And I realized at, at a certain point, I think we took that sort of voluntary approach about mm. as far as it could go. Yeah. And, and what I was getting hearing from some of these folks, at especially, I will say this: that company I mentioned, Course Smart, who's been they were really helpful in in this product process because they consolidated. That's the word maybe I'm looking for. Books from a bunch of different publishers Mm -hmm. and sold it with one format, right? As the course smart format. So they were starting to standardize the way of taking right. these different places mm-hmm. and putting them into a format that'd be recognizable across publishers. Exactly. So they wanted you to be a course smart school. They would be nothing happier. They would, nothing would have made them happier for a school to just buy 
all their electronic books mm -hmm. or have their students buy all electronic books because they represented multiple publishers. Right. So the distributor had a really strong interest in reducing barriers. Anything that made the school slow down and question them, right, and say, well, what about this? What about, you know, what about accessibility? They would want to answer that. Right. Right. And so... I, I kind of alluded to a little bit that maybe some of the reasons why these products weren't as accessible is because colleges and universities weren't speaking up. Mm -hmm. I, I, let me mm -hmm. amend that or expand on that. Individual colleges and universities definitely have been speaking up, mm. right? A particular college might say, we want our products to be accessible. You know, we want our students to get uh, accessible products. And the, the, the publisher might say, oh, let's see what we can do for you, you know, University of Toledo or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they're not changing their entire product line. They maybe make a deal so that university feels comfortable buying their products, right? One at a time. Right. So Whereas this the, reminds me of the difference uh, in like uh, universal accessibility for housing and things like that, where you could start building houses from the beginning with, you know, no barriers or, you know, minimizing the number of steps or if you even put steps in a house. Whereas most people end up just buying a house and then renovating it to make it work if they need something changed. Mm -hmm. and this seems like the same kind of thing is you could start from the beginning and from the ground up build books as something intended to be accessible right off the bat. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like what's still happening is a lot of this piece by piece, case by case, mm -hmm. trying to make customers happy instead of just uh, if you build it, they will come kind of uh, like feel the dreams. Right? analogy because it fits, fits pretty well with what we're talking about on it. Exactly. If we just build it as it be equal mm -hmm. for everyone, then you take out all the other steps after. Well, let me give a shout out as a, yeah. to, to Bookshare that the folks there um, recognized that and they started an initiative called Born Accessible. Mm -hmm. And it was the idea was promoting that very idea that, that the products, if they built it, the accessibility in at the beginning, that they could and didn't and didn't take it out as you went along. Right. So in other words, you might start accessibly, but as you're creating, like getting a book from beginning to end, there's editorial revisions, there's layout, you know, to make it look some of those things might interfere with the accessible characteristics of the file. Mm. And so, you know, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes to make before the book comes out, you know, in the final format. And so that's a lot for the publisher to, to deal with. Right. So, again, they, they that's up on their website now. That's one of the things that they do. Um, but why the industry as a whole, why some of these big giant companies, publishing companies didn't just simply turn their, you know, like they say, sometimes they want to turn their, you know, the, the battleship or the Titanic, you know, uh, 180 degrees all of a sudden is because they had years invested in their current systems. Like if they had a multi-million dollar system to produce the books with all the scheduling and components and that had these accessibility barriers, they're not going to throw that out overnight. They're going to say, well, you know, we're, as the next time we, you know, invest in new technology or maybe when we start a new product line, mm -hmm. right? right? That'll be the good stuff, uh -huh. right? So again, kind of bringing it back to the accessibility label, uh, there were a couple of conversations that really illuminated for me what the challenges were. And when, when somebody might, uh, at a publishing company would listen to the you know, kind of the spiel that I was giving them and say, that, that sounds gr great. We, we have some books that we could label, you know, specific ones that we've done that extra work fund. And I uh -huh. said, that's great. You know, those are the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to want, you know, people have to buy all your books mm -hmm. and to be Not fair. Right. right. So let's talk now, about the accessibility design of what this looks like, or at least not this, uh, the design, but what is actually in this label. Great. Oh, that's a great question. Okay. So the basics of, you know, keeping it to electronic documents. I think we, we, we probably could be familiar with a web page, right? We've all used the web. And so in a web page, you're navigating around, right? You're going to jump and there's links and things like that, that you might say, oh, I'm going to click on a link and go to somewhere else, go to another web page. But so if you take that model of accessibility, you know, sort of like that I'm navigating through the web and move that to a book, you do a lot of navigating in a book as, you know, maybe as a sighted mm -hmm. person, you, you would think um, that I'm going to look at the table of contents. Mm -hmm. That might be one, that, that might be my entry point and jump, you know, you scan the table of contents and go, aha, there's the chapter on, you know, 18, War of 1812. 
page 237. Boom, you go to page 237. So these are like hyperlinks, essentially. That Within could, the book, right. Yeah, right. So, or even like the definitions, which I love in textbooks or, or digital textbooks, yeah, right. when, you can, when you have a funny uh, word or a proprietary word for that particular discipline and you can click on it, it pulls up the definition for you or bounces you to the chapter that has more on that particular topic or something so, like that. And, and we're all familiar with search engines, right? That mm -hmm. we're going to search for a topic and then you may pull up a lot of searches, right? Remember the, the even the most, the, you know, the, the search engine we all use, something like a Google, it does a lot to try and give you the relevant mm -hmm. search results. Right. So asking somebody who to search a thousand page book every time they want to find something, that's not very practical. So that information to search the book, I call that navigation. So accessibility label would be, I call it roughly four parts and the, the mm -hmm. sort of accessibility statement, which would be kind of a way for the publisher to sort of set the groundworks to say, you know, yeah, this is some of the work we've done. These are some of the, you know, it's the, the positive aspects that we've done in general. Mm -hmm. Then navigation, how can I, how can I move around this document? Page numbers, that's, that's a pretty typical book feature, which surprisingly isn't in some electronic books, page numbers, headings, you know, that, that chapter headings, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that's a level of navigation. I want all those. Now, if these features are all in the book, that's a pretty accessible book, but they may not be. So again, this label mm -hmm. tells you if they're there or not. I could imagine. That would be so handy. Right? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm just thinking of like, if page numbers weren't accessible through navigation, just like that basic thing would end up, if you were to go back to a book, to you wouldn't have the page number and just be a mess. Well, that, that citation, exactly. right. The, the, just a simple thing, but it ends up really making a big difference. I, I, I would say that when we come to the technology, one, one of the common themes with accessibility is that things that are done for people, I've been mm -hmm. did this for people with disabilities, often have utility in the general marketplace. And a rich navigation, let's call it, of a like big electronic book, you know, thousand page book is very helpful to have so that you don't have to search around yeah. for it, right? And having us the read the software capable of navigating it for you. Right. And there's no drawback to just having that in your book. It's not gonna take it, away from but, someone else. Yeah. But it does add it does add time and energy in the production. And you're sure. trying to save every penny I'm in thinking, production. thinking, though, because I've, like Ben was saying before, like we, like audiobooks are actually becoming more popular. Right. And I feel like maybe we're starting to see that more in the everyday market as opposed to just yeah. accessibility. Maybe it's a theory. I don't know. But at least for me, I've been using it more. I use it when I'm looking at PDFs and I'm just wanting to listen to it to multitask. I don't know if it's really good to multitask <laughs> to do that at the same time. But I I feel like these navigation tools can also be used in other, like other yeah. ways too. A, a, a reader. Okay, so I think we derailed you. Yeah, you yeah. Sorry, navigation. Sorry. What are the other things okay. that are actually put on the label? We're getting to the really to the good one. The, the, yeah. So, so let's say it, it, analogy wise, navigation gets to the point, then you start reading. So that's content. Mm -hmm. So when accessibility issues, one of the main one is if you encounter visual information, you're, you're listening to text that says, see illustrations, you know? Mm -hmm. So that illustration should be described so the person right. without vision could, can basically understand what's in that. And that, that there actually is a lot of that going on right now, this image description. I'm starting to see this on social media where people are putting a caption under their pictures right. where they'll describe what's in the picture. Right. Ah. And that is essentially serving that same purpose of trying to illustrate if someone Somebody is listening uh, or reading social media with speech to text, for instance, and yeah. can't see the pictures. They can still have it illustrated for them visually. So other other kind of contents we touched mm -hmm. on mathematics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's of interest to you. Right. Uh, so any I would call that any symbolic content, foreign languages. So that if your software encounters a foreign language and doesn't know it's a foreign language, it's going to think it's a misspelled English yeah, word. Yeah. But if it's tagged and says the next three words are in Spanish, then the the actually the the software could then adjust and pronounce the Spanish more correctly. Mm. The reader will switch, uh, the, the, the digital right, the reader the will switch. will know it's Spanish because you've tagged it, mm -hmm. right? And when I say tag, it means that the person producing the file. It's like coding? They're right. Coding. Yeah. In, yeah. It's, there's it's a digital, like almost invisible tag. Yeah, no one exactly. actually sees right. that. Okay. Right, okay. right. Okay. So, and then there's other things that you might encounter. Uh, one of my favorites is phonetic symbols, which, you know, something like that, which, um, Generally, the computer is not prepared to speak aloud, so having it um, tagged properly. And again, tags is just a sort of generic term that right. someone, someone, <laughs> could be, uh, maybe it's artificial intelligence, but generally someone said, this particular bit of text is a symbol, an equation, something, and it's tagged properly. So the last section of the four sections of the label mm -hmm. is 
probably the most content is kind of the fine print. It's the hazards mm. or the issues. Mm. What are the known issues? So if you said, hey, we've done this good <laughs> accessibility thing. Here's all the navigation we have. Here's the content issues that we've done. Now, <clears throat> here's what you might encounter that we know you might have some problems with. You know, if some of those things aren't have not been done. Yes, so I'm looking at one of yours now that you have an example. It says, for example, for just for our listeners, some table rows and columns may not be labeled. Right. So right. I find this very cohesive, very nice, nice so, way to label. Well, here's here's where one that was. Now, you could do a whole other show on this. It would be a different technology show, and certainly maybe more of a publishing show, is on that digital rights management. Mm. So what happens when a book is encrypted or encoded is that you could only open it with a software that it was sold with. So Kindle, well, since we've mm-hmm. already brought that up, yeah. right? Kindle books can be open on Kindle. Mm-hmm. That's it. If you, you bought it, you know, if you bought it from that store and you can open it on their software, you can't open it on other software. You cannot. Mm-hmm. So a but speak- you could screenshot every single page and then optical character recognition all those pictures and then send them to whoever <laughs> yeah. you want. That's, that's, for go. instance, I mean, I'm just saying, that's I've never simple. done that, of course. Oh, radio. <laughs> 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 you're, you're, yeah, there are tech, there are workarounds, right? And that's let's put it another way: there are reasons why even with all the security that's on books, they still end up getting pirated, mm-hmm. right? Right. And so, a student with a disability though does not want to pirate it; they might want to use it with other software, though. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, I in some of these discussions I have with publishers and some of these distributors, I said digital rights management encryption is a sense locking the content; it's securing mm-hmm. it to the point where you, you, the distributor, decide. What can it be? What it can be used with, not the consumer, mm-hmm. right? And a consumer with a disability may have software that they like because it has a voice, you know, voice uh, speech engine that they like. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. They become familiar with that interface. If they can't open the book that they purchased on their software, I believe they should have the right to know that. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. putting it in the excess. Now, someone could say, well, gee, you know, that's somewhere down here over here in this other, you know, uh, piece of information. But putting that in the accessibility label, I think. Are there are there actual legitimate reasons to get pushback on this idea or are people just hard to change? Well, so. Uh, oh, the voluntarily, there's the one of the big distributors, the one that purchased CoreSmart. It's called Vital Source. Mm-hmm. They have actually done an accessibility label. Uh, they, they, and I give them I applaud, a huge applause, you know, uh, uh, for them. Co- big kudos <laughs> to, for doing that. And it, yeah. they did run into some of the issues that I've talked about. Um, it's not on all the books. Okay. So it does leave the question. You could say, well, gee, this book has one, but this book does not. Should I assume that the book that does not have one has none of the features? Are they just avoiding putting the label on books that don't have enough positive features to put in? Because it seems like you could use the label on any book and just say it's not these things. Yeah. They, they are a distributor, though. They work with, they work with multiple companies. Mm. So if that company hasn't given them the information or maybe hasn't cleared them to, to, pr- to provide it, yeah. they have to do what their partners mm-hmm. want. Okay. Okay. Now, I really want to make sure we give our listeners a chance to know where they can find more information about this if they're interested in trying to follow up or getting more involved. So where is the best place for people to navigate themselves to if they're interested in finding out more? Well, if you if, if anything I said <laughs> has, has been of interest to you and you'd like to know a little more, uh, my website, I can say it. Yeah, is, please. It's Kayla, C-A-I-L-A dot online. C-A-L-I-A dot online. And so this. Close. C- oh. <laughs> Did I, or was that right? I, I, <laughs> I, I, maybe I was just C-A-I-L-A. Oh, C-A-I-L-A. Uh, <laughs> C-A-I-L-I-A. C-A-L-I-A. No. Oh, my. L-A. C-A-I-L-A. Oh, my gosh. I am so messed up here. Okay. Well. I'm glad we've been, yeah. The, like, we have right. thoroughly confused our listeners now. You want to say it one more time cleanly for me? Because I just can't seem to get it out. www. That's always, that gives you a running start. www. C A I L A dot online, O N L I N E, which is a longer domain name than you some. But uh, so that's what I'm calling. I'll give it the name the Consumer Accessibility Information Label Association. Mm. So that's what I'm calling. It's a very loose group, though, to so, sort of promote that, uh, to promote the label. Just to correct something from the beginning, I am no longer with the Center for Accessible Materials mm. Innovation. That's a, that's That was a part of uh, what Georgia Tech, a grant at Georgia Tech. Mm. So I left that last summer, and I'm doing this uh, generally independently. Mm. So let's go as well into just the idea. So 
I just wanted to confirm as well, is this project also with a 11Y? Uh, the accessibility? Because <laughs> I also saw this project here, and I wanted to know as well if this is something that you've also worked on. Um, the, the A11Y is this funny. It's, it's worth talking about because you'll yeah. see this pop up. It's actually, like, I think it's the technical word is a numer. It stands for accessibility, mm-hmm. right? So um, different people have used that in different ways. It actually just kind of sounds like or looks like the word ally. Yeah. So you might find it. Other, there are other people have used these kind of numerums where it's just it's just kind of cryptic you know but a 11y and accessibility um we did this one of the names that we were working on was we called it accessibility or alley mm-hmm. facts alley facts so that was the name that we used during the grant project over at georgia tech uh kind of as we piloted this project um i will say this when i want when i basically wanted to kind of keep pushing this idea forward as it is now i said i was thinking it needs more feedback from the users i'd like to have the disability service providers and students especially involved in the process of Mm -hmm. making this label because and this was the other thing i think maybe the vital source folks again it's again to their credit that they did this but there's some very technical sounding jargon Mm -hmm. in there Mm -hmm. so you read the description of what it is the characteristic of accessibility and you're kind of scratching your head saying but what does that actually mean you know Mm. So there are things like that I think could be described in a little more, you know, user-friendly terms. So before just sort of, you know, kind of being a technologist to say, oh, we know how this is described. It's, you know, an interfacing layer, multi-layer. It's like, let's let's start with the people using this and say... You know, what, what mm-hmm. does this language mean? You know, what would you like to see this language yeah. be? And I'd like Bob, to Bob, thank you well, thank so thank much you. for coming on the show. We really, really appreciated your time. This has been it's such been a, a fast hour. It goes by <laughs> so quickly. We'd love to have you back again sometime and sure. hear about your progress. That would be wonderful. Uh, definitely. I'd love to, hopefully there is some progress to this, and I definitely will be you. looking out for it. Thank you. This is Modern Education. We have just been sitting down with Bob Martinegro as we have been... Oh, no. Martin Enga. Enno. Oh, my gosh. I'm... <laughs> Close enough. Help me out, Bob. Help me Martin out. Martin Enga. Martin Enga. There we go. Okay. So, we've been sitting down with Bob Martinengo and talking about accessibility and accessibility labels in uh, textbooks here at Modern Education. We really appreciate you coming in. We are here every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute as you do tile in uh, 90.1 KZSU Stanford. We will bring you more next week.